Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you and praise you for what you have in store for us this day. We thank you and praise you for opening our hearts and our minds to receive everything that you have for us in its fullness, Lord. I thank you for leading and guiding this message and all that's in it, Lord. And that we would receive and that we would grow and that we would be all that you would have us be for such a time as this. We surrender. We give you thanks and praise. We glorify and honor your name. You are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The title of my message is, What House Will You Build For Me? Let's turn to Exodus 25, starting with verse 1. This is the passage of scripture that is just after Moses went um, for 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain. And what was he doing there? He was receiving a download from the Lord, right? He got a major download from God on the mountain. And so the next section is what I'm going to read. It's entitled Offerings for the Sanctuary. And I'm going to read 1 through 9. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly, with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze. So notice that he says, from everyone who gives it willingly, with his heart, you shall take the offering. From the gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linens, and goat's hair, Ram skins, dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood. Oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings. Just so you shall make it. Just so you shall make it. That is the pattern of the tabernacle. And down in the helps it says, The tabernacle was a tent or dwelling place that was sacred, dedicated to God for his presence. This is why God gave to the Israelites the pattern, the precise plans for its construction and furnishings. The pattern, the precise plans of God. The word precise means clearly expressed, definite, exact, accurate, and correct. God so desired to dwell with his people that he developed a way to do that. It's always been his desire to cohabitate with his children, to dwell with us, to walk with us. Now let's look at Exodus 25, 40, really quick. And it says... And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. See to it. Make sure. See to it that it's exact. That exactly how I tell you. Because I want to be with you. And, and you will only be able to do that if you follow this pattern. My plan. You will be able to hold my presence if you follow this pattern. I can be with all of you. Now look at chapter 26. I'm going to read a little bit. This is talking about the curtain. And that's just the beginning. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread. With artistic designs of cherubim, you shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, and the width of each cu curtain, four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements five curtains shall be coupled to one another and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another and you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtains on the selvage 
of one set, and likewise you shall do on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops you shall make in the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain, that is on the end of the second set, that the loops may be clasped to one another, and you shall make fifty clasps of gold, and couple the curtains together with the clasps, so that it may be one tabernacle. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make 11 curtains. So I could keep going on and on and on, but you can see it's very precise. There is a distinct pattern that he wants them to follow. And he says, see to it that you make them according to the pattern which I show, to show you. See to it. And then if you read on in that chapter 26 you, and other chapters following that, you read about the Ark of the Covenant, the, the altar, the table of showbread, the lampstand, and don't forget, of course, the priest's garments. All very detailed patterns of how to create everything that's in the tabernacle. What detail? I mean, wow, that's pretty fine details that went into that tabernacle, also called the tent of meeting. And tabernacle means residence or dwelling place of Yahweh. God had specific, detailed, and perfect plans for the tabernacle. Elaborate, exquisite, and beautiful. Made with the finest ingredients and materials. Gold, silver, bronze, hand-dyed threads and linens, hand-dyed animal skins, oils and spices and onyx. It was exquisite. It was hardy. It was amazing and beautiful. When God designed something, you can be sure it's going to be good, right? It's going to be absolutely good because he is absolutely good. And he's a genius. He's a master builder. He's creator of all things. Thank you, Lord. If you remember my last message, those who, who were here, I talked about Noah's Ark and that how they made, that people have tried to replicate it and have done in miniature form, have tried to replicate and build it to the exact specifications that are mentioned. And, but on a much smaller level, and that they determined that it was very ingeniously built, only built by a divine creator, and that it was able to withstand the journey that it took based on the dimensions and the angles and, 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 and everything, the design and the, everything that went into it. It was able to perfectly withstand, and it was perfectly built for the journey that it took. As many of you know, we recently celebrated our 30th anniversary as a fellowship. And as I was preparing to share during that celebration, I don't see them up here right now, but I came across the blueprints or the plans for this church, it, for this, you know, this building. And in particular, the sanctuary. And I brought it in to share. And the Lord had specific plans. Oh, I can open something. I'm not sure what it is. This is just the core. Ooh, can't even move. I guess it's really, it maybe needs a little adjustment or something. Something's happened with it. That's not good. <laughs> Should I just turn it off and use the handheld mic? Sorry, everybody. Do you want me to try it again? Do you need new batteries? Because it's tight, wound up here, maybe. You want to like stand up there? Pause, everybody. <clears throat> maybe it's because it's all. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Thank you, <laughs> Praise Lord. God. Well, Pastor Jeremy just pointed out that the blueprints were actually tucked into the thing here. So I'm going to actually send it around so you can just take a look at it. It's pretty interesting. Hallelujah. Very precise. Pretty precise. Yeah, yes. Very precise. <laughs> it has to be. I'll hand them to Richard. 
you can pass them around and look at them. And the Lord had specific plans for this church, and Pastor Diane heard from heaven as, as she prayed about the details. And look what the Lord has built. I mean, look at this sanctuary. I mean, those who knew it before know, but this did not look like this at all. I mean, it was, it, there, it, there was holes in the ceiling. Birds had come, have come in and gone out. There was bird poop and feathers everywhere, and it was all raw, just wood open, exposed, and it was pretty in dilapidated shape. <laughs> but he restored it to this, what you see now. It's beautiful and amazing and exquisite. I would say exquisite. Yes. Hallelujah. Look what the Lord has done. He had a precise plan and purpose for this building structure, and here it is. Here it is. We're in it. Hallelujah. Psalm 127 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it and build it, he did. Yes. Hallelujah. Pastor Jeremy prayed out recently, Lord, you love this town. You love this community so much that you placed your ecclesia, your church, right here in the heart of it for such a time as this. God has a plan, a perfect plan for this fellowship. And he gave us, his people, this beautiful, well-built building to fulfill those plans, to come together. But we have to see to it that we follow his exact pattern and plan for the rest of it. God has a perfect plan for this state, for this country, for this nation, and all the nations of the world. As beautiful as this building is, what makes this church, this fellowship, what God intended it to be, is us, his children. And more specifically, his people who hear his voice and seek his will and his plan. Hearing his voice, seeking his face in all the decisions and the inner workings and details and in every way and everything that takes place here. I'd like to turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, starting with verse 20. Read 20 through 22. Very familiar, common scriptures. Having built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Down in the house it says, household literally means members of the family. Thank you, Lord. If you look back at the Exodus passages that I was reading from before, you'll find that the Lord had very specific instructions for the leadership. So I'm just going to go back there. It's Exodus 27. And I'm just going to read, actually, a little bit of the kingdom dynamics that's there in my Spirit-Filled Life Bible. And it's entitled, Taking Charge. God called Moses with a direct command to take charge. You shall command... The overseer must step in and take charge any time anytime he feels his delegated leader is moving in the wrong direction or confusion is beginning to find entrance. And I just want you to highlight, if you have a highlighter, circle it, if you have a, a pen, or just keep it in your mind or write it down however you want, um, the word overseer. The overseer must step in and take charge any time he feels like confusion is coming in, or we're going in the wrong direction. Two, you, bring, you shall bring close at times the leader, the leader leads by merely putting an arm around his subordinate's shoulder to affirm, identify with, or encourage. And three, you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, the leaders. The literal statement is speak to the wise in heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The overseer must step in and take charge, lest we be led astray in any way, being diligent that every piece and part is completely and utterly led of the Lord. 
Otherwise, it will go in the wrong direction and confusion will come in. And God does place people in leadership roles in the local church. But the leaders need to hear directly from heaven. The leaders need to hear who, from who is really in charge. And that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to take charge and lead. Holy Spirit led. It's him who must take charge. But we have to allow him to do that. I'm going to look at 1 Corinthians 3. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, starting with verse 16. First Corinthians three sixteen. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And down in the, in the house it says, The building is identified as God's temple made holy by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Here the temple of God is the local church. And then the next page it says, Paul does not specific is not does not specify how many how one may destroy the temple of God, that is the church. The word means to ruin through corrupting or seducing, thus any number of unworthy, immature, or crude means may apply. It may be false teaching by pride and spite or by immorality. Paul does make does make clear, however, that one defiling what will himself be brought to ruin. And I just wrote in there, see to it. He is in charge, that none of these things can come in and destroy the church. See to it that the Holy Spirit is in charge. From the beginning, as I mentioned already, and as we know, as Christians, as mature Christians, God's desire has always been to dwell with us. He desired a family. That's why he created Adam and Eve. It's always been his desire to have a relationship and dwell with his children. He walked in the cool of the day. With Adam and Eve. Leviticus 26, 11 through 12 says, I will put my dwelling place among you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. He wants to walk with his children. It's why he did, had those precise plans and patterns drawn up for Moses in the wilderness. He wanted to be with his people. He wants to be with his children. It's why he's made a way Ever since the, from the foundations of the world, he made a way for his people to dwell with him. Hallelujah. That's awesome and amazing. The creator of the universe, God Almighty, wants to be with us. He wants to be with us. <laughs> he wants to be with us. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord was the guiding force for the Israelites in Exodus 40, 30, through 38, his presence in the form of a cloud by day and fire by night told the people when to go and when to stay. He was always with them as they walked or as they journeyed. Then Jesus came. The presence of God was manifest through him. The living word, Logos, God with us. He lived among his people. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Reverend Joseph sent a, a text he always seems to do this the day before I have a message. And I want to read the text to you all because it's, it goes so well. A father wanted to read a magazine but was bothered by his little girl, Shelby. Finally, he tore a sheet out of his magazine on which was printed the map of the world. Tearing it into pieces, he gave it to Shelby and said, go into the other room and see if you can put this together. After a few minutes, Shelby returned and handed him the map, correctly fitted together. The father was surprised and asked how she had finished so quickly. Oh, she said, on the other side of the paper is a picture of Jesus. When I got all of Jesus back where he belonged, then the world came together. Help put the world back together. Spread the good news. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The pattern, the blueprint that restores buildings, relationships, and nations is Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to look at John 2, starting with verse 19.
John 2, 19 through 21. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it, was, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Hallelujah. Our Savior, the Savior of the world, died on the cross and took our punishment that we might have his righteousness credited to us. We are now justified by faith and have peace with God. And there was a practical manifestation of what happened at that moment when Jesus died. What happened? The curtain, the veil, was rent in two. Matthew 27, 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks split. Jesus paved the way for the new dwelling place of God, which, of course, is us. The new dwelling place is us. Let's go to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, starting with verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promises of the eternal inheritance. Hallelujah. Because of Jesus, we can now enter right into the sanctuary of God, right into the presence, his very presence. The meeting place is accessible 24-7. Anytime we want to, we can talk with him in the cool and walk with him in the cool of the day. Once again, oh, what joy floods my soul. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And the part that I want to spend more time on today is that each of us as individuals is a temple of the Holy Ghost. We are the temple. We are the meeting place. We are the dwelling place for God. Because it takes all of us little temples becoming the dwelling place of God for the whole house to be functioning in the fullness of his perfect plans. Hallelujah. And God has a perfect, a perfect and beautiful, precise pattern and plan for each of our individual lives. Each of us, every single person here, there is a precise and perfect pattern and plan for us, for you, for me. Say, God has a perfect plan for me. God has a perfect plan for me. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He knew us before the foundations of the world. He knows how many hairs are on your head. Do you know how many hairs are on your head? <laughs> Hallelujah. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He has a perfect plan, a blueprint, a pattern that he established and drew up. He drew up the pattern, the blueprints, before the beginning of time. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to take charge to see to it that the pattern is followed in every fine detail, lest we be led in the wrong direction or confusion comes in. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to take charge. The plans for the tabernacle were very specific, like we said, precise, perfect, detailed. How much more are the plans for yours and my life? Every piece and part, specific, 
precise, perfect, exquisite, and beautiful, down to the finest detail. We think we know what is best for us. We think we know our own desires, but God knows us better than we know ourselves. And he knows what is good for us way better than we do. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 2. And I'm going to actually read. You can turn there if you want to, but I'm actually going to read from the Passion Translation for that set of scriptures. It's 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 12. This is why the scripture says, things never discovered or heard of before, things beyond our ability to imagine. These are the many things God has in store for all his lovers. Say, I'm his lover. I'm his lover. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But God now unveils these profound realities to us by the Spirit. Yes, he has revealed to us his innermost heart and deepest mysteries through the Holy Spirit, who constantly explores all things. After all, who can really see into a person's heart and know his hidden impulses except for that person's spirit? So it is with God. His thoughts and secrets are only fully understood by his spirit, the spirit of God. And our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. For we did not receive the spirit of this world system, but the spirit of God so that we might come to understand and experience all that grace has lavished upon us. And we articulate these realities with the words imparted to us by the Spirit, and not with the words taught by human wisdom. We join together Spirit-revealed truths with Spirit-revealed words. Someone living on an entirely human level rejects the revelations of God's Spirit, for they make no sense to him. He can't understand the revelations of the Spirit because they are only discovered by the illumination of the Spirit. Those who live in the Spirit are able to carefully evaluate all things, and they are subject to the scrutiny of no one but God. Hallelujah. And I just love that, where it says back where I first started reading, things never discovered or heard of before, things beyond our ability to imagine, these are the many things God has in store for all his lovers. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And that includes all the things yet to be discovered in our own lives, in the plans and the purposes that he has for us in our present, in our future. Thank you, Lord. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit dwells in us. Let him take charge. Hallelujah. If Moses had done any piece of it on his own, or on his, in his own strength, it would not have been able to hold the presence of God. If Moses had built the ark with any of his own ideas, it would have sunk. Whenever the people of God strayed away from God's presence, they ended up in captivity and bondage. Ephesians 4, 13 and 14, 13 and 14 says, Till we all come to the unity of faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And we have a tendency to be tossed to and fro by our own thoughts. Oh, here's a thought floating by. Let's go with it. Our own plans, our own ideas, our own decisions, our own agendas. We have desires and impulses that we come up with in our own thoughts and ability or from things that we see or hear that sound good to us. We make big decisions about our own lives based on our own thoughts and ideas and plans. We make plans for our present, our future, without consulting God. But just like the ark and just like the tabernacle in Moses' day, we need to follow the blueprint. We need to see to it that the overseer takes charge of all those things. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. When we look to God in every decision and every move we make, big and little, we can be sure that it will be good, absolutely good, just like the ark that withstood all the storms of life. It was able to be upheld in the storms. And when they come, when the storms of life come, 
if we follow that pattern, that precise pattern, pattern of staying right in tune with God and being in communion with Him continuously, then the storms in life can come, but they won't injure us. They won't take us down. We won't sink. Amen. We won't be taken off course. Yes. We will stay the course. Amen. And remember in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, the Passion Translation says, says, things never discovered or heard before, things beyond our ability to imagine. Hallelujah. They are the many things God has in store for his lovers. How do we make sure that this temple is in line with his plans? Yes, we know prayer, right? But the answer is in many of the scriptures I've already read. It's in prayer, it's in time, in the, the word, but specifically the reason for the temple. What's the reason for the temple? To dwell with God. That's how we stay in line with the pattern. We dwell with the Lord. We tabernacle with him. What is his desire? Why did he make provision for a meeting place, a dwelling place? Because he wants to be with us. When we lie down and when we get up and when we walk by the way, he wants to be with us. Let's look at Psalm 27. Starting with verse 4. Read 4 through 8. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that may dwell, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me upon high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. The word seek God face is to strongly desire his presence and blessing. Strongly desire God's presence. Now I'm going to look at Jeremiah 29, 11. Very good passage of scriptures. Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 11. Read 11 through 14. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your hearts. Hallelujah. He has plans for us, plans for us to, to for a future and a hope. But we have to seek him and search for him with all our hearts. And he promises that we will find him. In the Kingdom Dynamics there it says, Throughout scripture we find repeated references to God's people seeking after him. Implied in these passages is a quest for God that includes a level of intensity beyond what might be termed ordinary prayer. The word search, along with the phrase with all your heart, suggests an earnestness that borders on desperation. The word search, derash, suggests a following after or close pursuit of a desired object. It also implies a diligence in the searching process. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 105, 3 through 4 says, Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek God and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We know this one. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he yes. will direct you. your path. You. Our pastor used to say, let's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 it. Mm -hmm. Anything that comes along, let's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 it. Mm -hmm. Right? 
I'm going to read those set of scriptures, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, from the Passion Translation. Because I like how it says it here, too. Trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you, and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do, and he will lead you wherever you go. Don't think for a moment that you know it all, for wisdom comes when you adore him. Wisdom comes when you adore him. I just love that. With undivided devotion, and avoid everything that's wrong. Then you will find the healing refreshment your body and spirit long for. Glorify God with all your wealth, honoring him with your very best, with every increase that comes to you. Then every dimension of your life will overflow with blessings from an uncontainable source of inner joy. Wow, that's pretty good. I like that. I'm just going to read the, uh, a little bit of the kingdom dynamics for that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 out of the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. So I'm just going to turn there really quick. If you have this thing, Bible, and you want to read along, you can do that. And this is what it says for Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In all your ways. The word ways means a road, a course, or a mode of action. It suggests specific opportunities a person may encounter on a reoccurring daily basis, the most common segment of opportunity on a daily basis we experience regularly is each new day. Hallelujah. It is as if this passage suggests that in all your days, acknowledge God, and in doing so, he will direct our paths. I, was, I would say in all your seconds, in all your minutes, in all your hours of every day, acknowledge God. And in doing so, he will direct your path. Mm -hmm. And of equal significance is the word acknowledge. It's translated know, meaning to know by observation, investigation, reflection, or firsthand experience. But the highest level of acknowledge is in direct, intimate contact. This <coughs> refers to life-giving intimacy as in marriage, applies, applied to a spiritual context. It suggests an intimacy with God in prayer that conceives and births blessings and victories joined to our Proverbs text, we might conclude that if in all our days we maintain or acknowledge God, God promises to direct, direct our paths toward fruitful, life-begetting endeavors. Fruitful, life-begetting endeavors. Hallelujah. This morning in Sunday school with Sophia, I gave her a little tidbit of this message, and I had a little illustration that I, I showed her, I, I took a, a piece of paper and I took a cup and outlined the circle, and then I cut out the circle, and that was the pattern for the first one. But then I took that circle and I made another circle with it, and then I cut out that circle, and then I take that, took that circle and used it to make another circle. And so I would use the, the circle that I just made to make the new circle. And then at the end, I did six of them. I took the sixth circle and I put it back to the first circle. It wasn't exactly the same. The farther away I got from the pattern, the farther away from the precise, exact pattern of the first one in the beginning. Hallelujah. Acknowledge him in all our ways. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We have to get over ourselves. We must die daily, as Paul says. We must decrease so that he can increase. Strongly desire God's presence. It's more precious than silver, more costly than gold, more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing that we ever desire compares with him. There is nothing better. Better is one day in his court, better is one day in his house, than a thousand elsewhere. As I was studying for this message, and thinking about the word seek, I was thinking about a hunting rifle. And of course, as we know, uh, the hunting season today, the final season of regular rifle season is today. And it's been going on in my house for the last couple of weeks. And I have rifles and, and hunting gear on tables and strewn around the house right now. So it's kind of on my mind. But that's what came to my mind when I thought about the word seek and focus. I thought about a hunting rifle, and an image popped 
popped into my mind that Jeremy had shown me years ago of a famous Vermont hunter, Larry Benoit. On the cover of a sporting magazine, Sports a Field, Sports something magazine, in which he, who the hunter, Larry Benoit, was on the cover, and he was holding a rifle, and he was looking down the barrel of the, in the sights of the rifle, and it was pointed right at the camera, so it was as if you were looking right at the, the sights, that he was, had his eyes right on you. And they were aimed squarely at the camera. Set your sights on Jesus. This eye was closed. It was a narrow focus. He was setting his sight. It was very precise. The sights are very precise. Any of you who knows anything about guns, you have to take them to, to set the sights and to make sure they're precise and accurate so that when, you're, when you aim it at something, it's going to hit the mark. Hallelujah. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Keep him the main focus of your affections. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth shall grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things of earth being those fleshly desires, attitudes, opinions, and also circumstances, situations in our lives. When we turn our eyes on him, everything else fades away. Everything fades into the background. All that we see is him. Anything could be going on in our life, good or bad. If our focus is Jesus, then it all fades away. And we gain a heavenly perspective on all of it. It's why Jesus could with joy endure the cross, because he set his sights on his Father and the plan, the perfect plan. And I'm going to read Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 in the Passion Translation again. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. How are we doing for time, Lee? Y'all with me still? <laughs> okay. Um. Hebrews 12, starting with verse 1, it says, As for us, we have all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us, and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination, for the path has been already marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. He endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to go to Psalm 123, also in the Passion Translation, and read that. Psalm 123, 1 and 2. It says, O oh God, enthroned in heaven, I lift my eyes toward you in worship. The way I love you is like the way a servant wants to please his master, the way a maid waits for the orders of her mistress. We look to you, our God, with passionate longing to please you and discover more of your mercy and grace. For we have had more than our fill of this scoffing and scorn, this mistreatment by the wealthy. Lord, show us your mercy. Hallelujah. I lift my eyes toward you in worship. I lift my eyes up unto the mountain. Hallelujah. Where does my help come from? Psalm 63, 1 through 8, the New King James Version. It says, oh, I'm going to read it from here first. And then I'll read you the New King James Version. Psalm 63, starting with verse 1. One through 8. For the pure and shining one, King David's song, when he was exiled in, Judea, in the Judean wilderness. Oh God. So this was when David was in exile. O oh God of my life, I'm lovesick for you in this weary wilderness. I thirst with the deepest longings to love you more, with cravings in my heart that can't be described. Such yearnings grip my soul for you, my God. I'm energized every time I enter your heavenly sanctuary to seek more of your power and drink in more of your glory. For your tender mercies mean more to me than life itself. How I love and praise you, God. Daily I will worship you passionately with all my heart. 
My arms will wave to you like banners of praise. I overflow with praise when I come before you, for the anointing of your presence satisfies me like nothing else. You are such a rich banquet of pleasure to my soul. I lie awake each night thinking of you and reflecting on how you help me like a father. I sing through the night under your splendor shadow, offering up to you my songs of delight and joy. With passion I pursue and cling to you because I feel your grip on my life. I keep my soul cl close to your heart. Hallelujah. In the New King James Version, as I started to say before, it says, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. <laughs> Hallelujah. And this is when David was hiding in the desert from Absalom. That's seeking God's face. He was seeking God's face in the midst of that trial. Hallelujah. And I thought about, as I cut out those circles, I also thought about the message that Pastor Diane gave years ago when she talked about the pattern of a dress and a seamstress making a dress. And I think she was talking about her mom making her dresses when she was little and that you have to follow the pattern precisely or else it's not going to fit. It's not going to fit you. If you wanted the garment you were making to come out as it should fit, you had to follow precisely the pattern to a T. Hallelujah. And she, of course, was using that analogy as an analogy, analogy of Jesus and the pattern that he set before us. He was a perfect example for us to follow. In Scripture, it tells us that he didn't do anything apart from his father. He didn't, he didn't go anywhere. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything apart from his father. father. And that is the pattern that we're to follow. We don't do anything apart from the father. He knows what's best for us. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25, the message translation says this. This is the kind of life you've been invited to, the kind of life Christ lived. He suffered everything that came his way, so you would know that it could be done, and also know how to do it step by step. He never did one thing wrong. He never did one thing apart from the Father. Not once said anything amiss. They called him every name in the book, and he said nothing back. He suffered in silence, content to let God set things right. He used his his servant body to carry out sins to the cross so we could be rid of sin, free to live the right way, close to God, in the pattern of God. His wounds became your healing. You were lost sheep with no idea who you were or where you were going. Now you're named. He knows your name and kept for good by the shepherd of your souls. In the New King James Version, for this these verses. I'm just going to turn there. It's 1 Peter 2.21. I'm almost, I'm, I'm getting close to the end, but this is good. I don't want to miss this. I love this part. 1 Peter 2.21-25. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you would follow his steps who committed no sin, nor, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Hallelujah. Remember that word? I had you underlined, overseer in the tabernacle, the overseer who took charge. He's the overseer of our souls. We want him to take charge of our souls. I looked up the word overseers. In the Greek, it's episkopos. And I looked, it means superintendent. We have a building superintendent. Or should I say a temple superintendent? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And when we allow him to take charge of the building, it will run smoothly and efficiently. He takes care of everything. He fixes what's broken. He makes sure it's clean. He keeps it safe. He's responsible for the entire structure. 
but we have to allow him to take charge. Hallelujah. And I have a couple more scriptures. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 10. Starting with verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then 11, if you skip over to 1, 11, 1, it says, imitate me just as I also imitate God. Whatever you do, imitate Christ and do it to the glory of God. Let him be in charge of all the decisions you make. Colossians 3, 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every move you make, every decision, big or small, it is imperative to make sure that it is your, his plan for you. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the architect of our lives. And he has exquisite, perfect plans, a blueprint made before the foundation of the world for you, every fine detail of your life. He has a plan for it. Crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And the message translation says, what actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to oppress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going back. I am not going back on that. Hallelujah. Dying to self sounds painful, but it's actually the best decision that we can ever make for our lives. And only can lead to good, perfect, good, precise, exquisite, beautiful things. It leads to the perfection of all the plans that he has for us. Hallelujah. To a meaningful life. The life that he created you for, for such a time as this. Hallelujah. We die to our plans, our desires, our comforts, our opinions, our passions, our desires. He must increase, and I must decrease. Thank you, Lord. Each one of us was born for such a time as this. There is a perfect, precise plan or blueprint or pattern, whatever you want to call it, for each of our lives individually. But in order for that perfect, beautiful plan to unfold, and take place, we have to seek God's beautiful face daily and in every way, die to our own ambitions and let the Holy Spirit take charge. And not for our benefit only, but for the world around us. When we are fulfilling those perfect plans, we are representing him to the world. When we're that close in communion with God, God in, in us, we in God, we are one, all of that, we are, an, we can, provide an encounter for those we come across, an encounter with the Lord. When we're that close with him, we are an encounter for those who are lost to meet God. And I'm going to close with this message, this message with a question, a question from the Lord, actually. So let's look at Acts 7, 44 through 49. Acts 7.44 Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he, appointed instructing, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the day, days of David, 
who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord. Hallelujah. What house will you build for him? What house will you build for God? Hallelujah. Let him take charge of every single detail. His plan is good. His plan is perfect. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. I surrender. I surrender to your perfect will and your perfect plan, Lord. I thank you and praise you, Lord. Help us all to fulfill every single plan, every single purpose that you have for our lives. Help us to inquire of your will for us in every decision that we make. In, in the very instant that we wake up in the morning, throughout the day, everywhere we go, everything we do, keeping your presence with us at all times so that we can know what is that good and perfect plan of the Lord because we're seeking your face. We're dwelling with you, Lord. We walk with you in the cool of the day. I thank you and praise you, Lord, for being our guide. Holy Spirit, take charge. Yes. Take charge of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Does anybody have a...